listen to RN music shows on demand. abc.net.au slash rn. from the representative chamber to wander over to the unrepresentative chamber and account for himself. You've got to be joking. You've got to be joking. Now, whether the Treasurer wish to go there or not, I would forbid him going. Forbid him going to the Senate. Branding the Australian Senate unrepresentative swill back in 1992 when he was Prime Minister. Hello and welcome to Big Ideas on RN Online and on your mobile. I'm Paul Barclay. Keating's belittling of the Senate is of course far from unique. Just recently Tony Abbott, frustrated by the behaviour of the Upper House, referred to it as feral. It is rare for a government to command a majority in both houses of federal parliament. Thus, the Senate can be a constant thorn in its side. But the current Senate crossbench, which holds the balance of power, has been particularly contentious. So much so, plans are afoot to change the voting laws to thwart the election of micro-party candidates who receive a tiny number of votes. Ricky Muir of the Motoring Enthusiasts Party was, in 2013, elected to the Senate despite gaining a mere half of 1% of the primary vote. An Australian Sports Party candidate was also initially elected with 0.23% of first preference votes before the WA Senate count was declared void. It was all to do with group ticket preferencing. A joint parliamentary committee has put forward bipartisan recommendations for reform of Senate voting. Are the changes needed? This was the question put to a panel of experts at the Noosa Long Weekend Festival last month. Mel Bruff is the Federal Liberal Member for Fisher and a former Government Minister. Anthony Green is the ABC's Election Analyst. Graham Young is the publisher of Online Opinion, Executive Director of the Australian Institute for Progress and a former State Campaign Chairman and Vice President of the Queensland Liberal Party. And Glenn Drury is the man they call the Preference Whisperer, an independent and minor party strategist and electoral campaigner. He helped to strike the group ticket preference deals with micro parties at the last election. But he's cagey about exactly who he was working for. I'm not sure that I can tell you who I worked for. Unless my clients choose to go public, then I certainly don't tell you who they are. So, um... But your clients are, it's fair to say, micro parties and independent y candidates. Yes they are and I can say that I was very happy with the result. Well specifically I won't say who my clients were. So you can't tell us whether you're working for instance for Ricky Muir or the Motoring Enthusiasts Party? Well what I can say to you is I have a hand in seven of the eight cross benches that are there. <laughs> Without going to specifics, so and and uh, what I did or didn't do is we'll leave up to speculation. But um, I do sleep well at night. You may think that. Yes. Seven out of eight, three of them were senators from the Palm United Party. So even my mathematics works that one out. Well, I, I have had a hand one way or another in the election of seven of them, and and we'll just leave it at that. So, so Glenn, what do you think the public? the voters make of a voting system that results in someone with 0.5% of the primary vote winning one of the 40 seats in the Senate? Well, I would say that, that a system that allows people such as these people here in the audience, or you, or me, or any of us to, to get elected is a good system. <laughs> We, we could have a system like that in the US that is dominated by the two major parties and indeed we did have that and we have had that for many, many years. In my view, multi-party democracy or a diversity of views in the parliament is a very good thing. Are you exploiting a weakness in the Senate system? I wouldn't call it a weakness and I would say that that system that we have is something that's been put there by the major parties starting from about 100 years ago and has kind of evolved or merged into what we have today. Mel Bruff, do you think there's something fundamentally wrong with the Senate voting system? Well, first of all, I, I congratulate Glenn because he's highlighted an issue which is fundamentally undemocratic and therefore we need to address it. And what do I mean by that is, first of all, I agree with his proposal, his proposition that minor parties should be able to gain a place in the Senate. 
But when you have a situation where people who are diametrically opposed, communists versus fascists, Christians versus atheists, pro-guns versus for guns, just to give you three examples, all saying, I'll tell you what we'll all do, is we'll spin the bottle and one of you, the bottle will land on and you'll get elected. It means that the voter who has cast their ballot pool saying that I am for a particular set of principles finds that that vote filters down to someone who is absolutely diametrically opposed. Well, that's, that's and not that is how it well, works. Okay, please. That's explain. not how it works. The fascists don't necessarily deal with the communists uh, in, in some sort of contrived arrangement that you suggested, but they do preference each other. They have to preference each other. Well, that's the point. Is that but ultimately... No, no, the point is that these are the rules well, let me just finish. Well, no, I agree with that. It's agree compulsory with that. preferential voting, so they must preference each other. I agree with that, but what you've said to them is, what we'll do is we'll lock out people who may be more leaning towards us, take the uh, Family First Party, who's, you know, their, their policy perspectives are more in line with the right than they are of the left, but what they end up doing is potentially because of this beyond your belief system, beyond your value system, make sure that you lock out the major parties in preference to a minor party, even if that party is totally opposed to everything you stand for. If you had set up a system which said, all of you are of like mind, but you have your own agendas, and we're going to swap preferences amongst you, and all of you over here who may be on the left have the like mind, totally support your notion. But when they are doing that, it is actually, de it's actually deceiving the voter, because 99% of them do not know how those preferences flow, and I know you can say that it's up there on the AEC website for them to see, but I tell you what, you almost need to be a Rhodes Scholar to be able to do it. Okay. But, 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 but hang on, Mel, that's not how you do preferences. You don't do preferences on the basis of who is most like me. You do preferences on the basis of how am I most likely to win. Yep. And all the major parties, preference parties, in the, the process in the House of Representatives and so on, that they don't agree with. Your problem. I mean, in the Liberal no, Party, we often brain. used to say, as long as we're above the Labor Party, we don't care no. what the order is, as long as people can fill it in. This if your assumptions in the beginning are wrong, and you don't end up mm. being in a position where you get those preferences, then yeah, your preferences might be going to someone you don't favour, but you don't know in any preferential system exactly what's going to happen, because it's the will of the people, which can't be but, known in but advance. But that's the, isn't that the point? That Absolutely. if I, for example, vote for the Christians and end up electing the sex party, <laughs> that we have a system where we're not electing the person that we thought we were electing. If you do the group voting, that's always a possibility. Isn't that what always we hear? Because we all disagree. We're all saying for different reasons, well, maybe not all, but, but well, most of us are saying... That I like being the underdog, by the way. Sorry? I enjoy being the underdog. <laughs> it's, it's actually about the flaws in the system. I'm not disagreeing with what you just said either, Graham. What I'm saying is that that actually... Uh, disenfranchises the voter, I think Ed, that's okay. going to give what's, us some sense. And what's, what's wrong with the current system is preferential voting and in the upper house it, prefer, um, ST uh, transferable vote form of the preferential system. The system is designed, the counting system is designed to take all the preferences that people have given and by a set of rules in the lower house produce the most preferred candidate or in the upper house the six candidates who can be viewed as the most preferred. When you do your preference ticket, most of the time you're doing on the basis of somebody like you or some sort of strategic deal. With group ticket voting it encourages the parties particularly the major parties, and this is how Family First got elected in Victoria, to do a deal. If you can guarantee 95, 98% of your preferences will flow by a particular ticket, and this is what happened in Victoria, the party can trade off, all right, do I want to do a preference deal with other parties to maximise my own election, or do I want to do a preference deal which ensures the person I, I would be most likely to work with is elected? And that's what the Labor Party did in Victoria when Family First was elected. It tried to maximise the chances of this third candidate getting up ahead of the Green. But in doing that, it didn't poll as well as expected, and the preference ticket system completely subverted mm. that. Now, yeah. if but voters had had to give their own preferences, that deal would not have been There done. is only one way of getting around the problem that Mel raises, and that's to have an exhaustive preferential yeah. system. Okay. An exhaustive preferential system means that you have multiple votes. So you have a first ballot, and then you put out the person that comes last, and then you reballot it again. Now that's obviously not possible to do under a, a, a general election. So we've got this compromise system where we have a preferential system where you say, well, here's my order, and then the preferences will fall where they fall, but we'll just have to vote once. And that's the, pra the, the alternative to that is you have first past the post. And then the problems with first past the post is if you've got three parties, so take the, the UK election. So you had the, the Conservatives, you had the, the Liberal Party, and you had the, the ALP. 
and then uh, the, the Labor Party rather, and then up in Scotland you had the Scottish Nationalists. Now voters in those situations aren't really sure so how it's going to fall because you know, for example, the Tory, well, what people end up doing is they say, well, this is basically a Tory seat, and even though I'm more a Liberal voter than a Tory, if I vote Liberal, there's a chance that Labor will get in, so I won't do that. So they've got to do the same sort of guessing, but um, that's the only alternative where it's people actually know where they put Anthony, the is that the only alternative? See, I don't know, you do. I think the alternative, I think the alternative, the problem is the ticket voting system. Now, the ticket voting was introduced in 1984 because we'd had full preferential voting for the Senate under this sort of system since 1919. And between 1919 and 1983, the average, and I say average, informal vote in the Senate was 9.5%. People could not fill in 50 or 60 preferences. In 1974, the double dissolution, and a deliberate attempt to form up the informal vote in New South Wales and stop Labor winning six seats of that year's double di dissolution. They stacked the ballot paper. Conservatives opposed to Whitlam stacked the ballot paper with dozens and dozens of candidates and they got a record informal vote. And after that, Labor was determined to introduce optional preferential voting in the Senate so you didn't have the number on the squares. In 1984, when Labor was back in power and they changed the law, the Liberal Party and the Democrats wouldn't buy optional preferential voting and the system that was come up with to solve the informal voting problem was this ticket voting system where you only had to number one square and then the preferences would go automatically. So that was what it was done. It was introduced for to fix the informal vote problem. The parties, if they thought it was useful to have tighter control of their preferences, but because of the smaller ballot papers then, they already controlled their preferences with how to vote cards, so it didn't seem to be an issue. What happened over time was that What's goose, good for the goose is good for the gander. This gave 100% control of preferences to a party. And for a major party, that didn't matter much because they roughly already had that. But for the micro parties who don't campaign, who don't hand out to vote cards, suddenly could control all their votes. And so what you get is a stacking of the ballot paper. And, so and, and Anthony, not over 90% of voters vote above the line in the Senate, is that right? Roughly 95 to uh, over 98%. And there's a simple reason. If you're given a ballot paper, as in the case in... And I'll hold... Show, show, show them the ballot paper. This is the Senate ballot paper above my head, one metre long, 110 candidates. There's a Terry Towling version from Newsday, isn't there? <laughs> it was, the font size was so small, and I'll raise this, they issued these magnifying sheets so you could read them. The voters of New South Wales had two choices, a one above the line or to number 110 squares below the line. They were the only two options you had. And understandably, to, in a polling station which is 600 millimetres wide to manipulate a ballot paper a metre long that you can't read using a magnifying sheet and keeping track of numbers from 1 to 110 at the same time. Understandably people voted one above the line and they got confused because the Liberal Democrats were in column A and the Liberals and Nationals were at the other end of the ballot paper and the Liberal Democrats got 9.5%. So clearly this is what the principle is at play here. Now people view me being opinionated on this but I happen to hold as a very fundamental principle of elections <laughs> that people should be able to read their ballot papers. <laughs> <laughs> now if someone wants to argue the opposite case they are quite capable of doing so. And if I, if I may. Thing to say, when they turn up to vote and they vote for somebody they should be able to know how that vote is transferred. Now if you have a degree in econometrics you can model how upper house senate tickets might work and so if you fill in a vote above the line where your preference has gone but it's a book it's a substantial book for new south wales with one or two or three tickets every party and you have no idea how that's going to work out and in the case of victoria with um mr muir and in western australia with the sports party that's the way those tickets under the control work now people should be able to know how this system goes now i wrote back in 1997 like 18 years ago that then this was relating to the New South Wales Upper House, that under current electoral laws in New South Wales, the next election will be reduced to a political farce, and instead of 21 members being elected by public will, they'll be rorting in voter confusion. The result will be the election, an election determined by voters incapable of reading the ballot paper, unable to manipulate a ballot paper one metre square, or simply bewildered and unable to find the party they want to vote for. Now, I wrote that 18 years ago, and I'd like to think, you know, I get held up for what were my predictions. Well, that was a prediction 18 years ago and it happened and I'll show you the ballot paper I was going to control. This is the New South Wales Upper House ballot paper in 1999. Which... <laughs> right? The so-called tablecloth. That's what I was paper. writing about. <laughs> that 
had 264 candidates on 80, 81 <laughs> columns, triple, triple decked. Now, I did some research on people who voted line on, below the line on the ballot paper, and thankfully it was optional preferential voting. There were 649 people who managed to number from one to 264. Were you, were you one of them, Anthony? No. I was one. No, you weren't. My bad was that. Glenn, have you ever had to do with this? Uh, uh, one you, were you one of them, were you, Glenn? Yeah. Uh, I did vote below the line, yes. <laughs> one of them. One of them at election was actually a donkey vote. Now, if someone bothered to donkey vote from under 264, that should be taken off their own. Um, so I think that's... I had a reason not to go home. <laughs> there are... One, some, one person actually coloured it in, obviously brought some crayons in and coloured. It's on the wall of the Electoral Commission. Can I just make yeah. a point? This is great entertainment. We've got ballot papers that are a metre long and one here that will cover your picnic table. What a wonderful thing of a democracy that, that ordinary people can run. I wouldn't care if the ballot paper was three metres long. <laughs> interferes with the choices that people make. Well, that's, a, that's a key word, choices. Yeah. Yeah, actually, choices. Graham, I, was going, I was going to ask you this, Graham. Do you think that anything that challenges the dominance of the two parties, of the oligopoly that they essentially enjoy over Australian politics is a good thing? The fact that we get into our parliament today more diverse candidates, you know, your Jackie Lambies and your Glenn Muir's, for example, that, that well, why is that not a good thing? Well, I mean, I think we're sort of arguing for the perfect here, but in fact there is no perfect. So you, you're talking about alternatives. And there's a Senate uh, committee that has made recommendations which, uh, looking at it, suggests to me that uh, the oligopolies got together. It's interesting the language they use in the executive summary. They talk about this has been a bipartisan report. That means two parties. Uh, in fact, the Greens went along with it, so it was tripartisan, but you can see the mindset that's there. No and minor parties were represented in that joint And no minor parties no were one. represented, no. And the, and the um, outcome of that report, sorry to interrupt, was that the Greens, the Coalition and the Labor Party want to get rid of minor parties. Yeah, but, well, that's basically what I was going to say. The voting system that they're recommending is optional preferential. Uh, now, we used to have first past the post voting in the Senate and they got rid of that and put the preferential in because the result of that was that in one election the party that won the lower house also won all but two of the seats in the Senate. So we used to think of the Senate as being providing a balance to what happens in the House of Representatives. When you had first past the post it didn't do that at all. Uh, and optional preferential can lead to effectively de facto first past the post. Now if you look at how people vote in the Senate versus how they vote in the House of Representatives, there is a distinct difference. Most people vote the same way in the Senate as they do in the House of Representatives, but a substantial proportion don't. And a substantial proportion vote for minor parties. If you take the recommendations that the Senate committee has come up with, I think what that will lead to is that the minor parties will get frozen out. That doesn't, yes. in my view, reflect the will of the people. We're, we're, and and the other point I'd make is that the Jackie Lambies and, um, and, and people like that of this world there's a bit of classism, I think, goes, goes on here. You know, we're all middle class in this room. We look down on those people because, you know, they don't speak quite right and they may, maybe don't use the right knife and fork at the table and, you know, maybe he does go around throwing kangaroo poo. That doesn't mean that he, he might not be capable of making as good a contribution to political debate as other people. And I can tell you, having a major party background, we do put a few donkeys in there. Can, can I just, uh, we just got the apparatus to deal with them. I just want to support Graham's last point because you get this notion, and I was elected with Pauline Hanson at the same time. She was a Liberal, as you all know the story. The Federal Parliament is 150 members in the lower house. When I went there, I thought, just don't embarrass yourself because clearly they're all going to be so intelligent, so well read. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm being really genuine here. I mean, I, it was a genuine thought. The, the trepidation. It was very young. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of the Parliament can be seen as the weakness, but it's also its strength. It is absolutely representative. It's not absolutely representative because you have to toe the party line. No, we don't. Well, and in fact, when, and in when fact, was the last time you crossed the floor? Mate, uh, geez, can't you remember what I did only about three months ago regarding changing Medicare co-payments co and actually went against the government's position, public and the and Prime Minister? And congratulations for that. So but, I just but, answered your question. What's but, the next one? <laughs> Mel Bruff, the federal member for Fisher and a former government minister. This is Big Ideas on RN and online. Does the Senate need reforming? That's the question we're discussing at the Noosa Long Weekend Festival. Our other speakers are Anthony Green, Graham Young and Glenn Drury. Back to the discussion and Mel Bruff. If you think the only way you get eccentric characters is to have minor parties, you're wrong. Well, let, let me put it another way, if I may. Yeah. Just, just, just 
turn this around to something a little bit different. But let's just say the <laughs> only... <an> argument. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> 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 but let's talk about maybe Coles and Woolies in a small town like, say, Gympie. Yep. And forever, all we've had is Coles and Woolies, and all of a sudden, small businesses come along, and, and you would be arguing that Coles and Woolies satisfy everything you need. We don't need a baker, we don't need a butcher or a candlestick maker. We can do it all for you. It's, that's not how we think in this country. No, okay, so, but thanks so even, even, if, uh, even if we agree that diversity of uh, political parties and independence is a good thing for the body politic, we still come back to this issue of people being elected to Parliament off tiny votes, you know, 0.5 per cent. And so this brings us to the issue of what can be done about it, what type of reforms we should introduce. And, and Anthony, you've got some thoughts. You, uh, you spoke to the, uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters and gave them your views about how we could reform the system. What well, did you say? Their proposal is to get rid of the ticket voting system, which allows parties to just endlessly hand on preferences that are cast above the line. Look, the, the, the issue about Ricky Muir or, or Jackie Lammy, to me, is about the process about how people get elected. Um, it's not... And the issue of representation is a criticism of the sort of people who end up in Parliament, that maybe we need another system which gets more average sort of people in Parliament. But we've, we've always had that. We do have too many lawyers and too many union officials. But the problem with, say, Muir's election, why did he get elected rather than the nine other micro-parties that got more votes than him? Why did the sports party get elected in Western Australia when it was 21st of the 27 parties on the ballot paper, had 15 parties with more votes than it, and got elected on the preferences of 20 other parties in preordained tickets picked by the people who organise the tickets. That's what's wrong with the current system, is that in, in the case of Victoria, everybody could have voted exactly the same way, but if the tickets had been arranged differently, someone else would have been elected. It's the organising of the tickets the problem. Under the current system, there are half a dozen parties which exist on Christian moral principles, the Christian Democrats, the Family, family First, the Australian Christians, Rise Up Australia, the DLP to some extent. You've also got several outdoor recreation parties, Shooters and Fishers Party, Australian Fishing and Lifestyle Party, the Fishing Party. Why are they all running against each other? Why isn't there one party? There's probably a good 5% of the vote out there who will vote for an established Christian party, but there isn't one, and there never will be one as long as this electoral system exists, because these parties can all run against each other and swap preferences. In the case of Western Australia, if you look at all the people who voted below the line, and of the 20 odd parties that directed preferences to the sports party and got him elected and delivered 100% of preferences, the people who voted below the line, 13% voted for him. They'd never heard of him. In the case of Ricky Muir versus Helen Kroger for the Liberal Party, if you go and look at the below the line votes of parties like the Family First, Family First elected Ricky Muir with their preferences. The people who voted for Family First, 80% of those preferences went to the Liberal Party. That's where they naturally have a home. That's their affinity. But these deals are done and swapped around, and there will never be other small parties as long as this system exists because there is no reason for them to organise and campaign for votes. They don't need to campaign for votes. You stack the ballot paper, make it unreadable, do impenetrable bit deals, and one of you might fluke it out and get elected. Well, the, it's not a matter of getting out there I, and I out use the word fluke, Anthony. It, <laughs> no, but that's, if it's not fluke, it's even worse because it's organised by somebody. <laughs> principle, Anthony, that politics shouldn't be organised. No, <laughs> no, I, I think Since when haven't the major parties been organising? And the electoral <laughs> system should rely on actually candidates getting out there and campaigning. They should actually be doing things. I, I think they shouldn't th th accidentally get in I there. I think there's something we've got to spell out here, and that is that we're really talking about the last Senate position yeah. in, in each state. I can tell you with a high degree of certainty who's going to win the first four spots, because it'll be the major parties. Mm -hmm. So you're only arguing against the spots about the spots at the bottom. So you're arguing, you're arguing, sorry, Graham, you're arguing over the balance of power potentially in the Senate. You are arguing about the balance of power, but it's always going to be someone who is unknown. I've had senators tell me I've got a great personal vote. Um, they don't. They get up there on the party vote, and generally the person who's number three on the ticket, who sometimes gets up, is a complete unknown. And they get there by a fluke. Because when, once you get down to that last spot, no one can tell you with any certainty what's going to happen. It's just a matter of luck. And, you know, to give you an example of this, again, coming back to this, well, parties that don't like each other uh, are giving preferences. Jim Killen in the lower house seat of Morton in 1961 in that election famously won on Communist Party preferences. Mm -hmm. Do you think they wanted to put Menzies back? No bloody way. Well, as did the Greens, Kerry Nettle was elected. That doesn't make it right, by the way. 
You, do, you two just made the point, and I think Glenn would agree with you on this issue, is the Electoral Matters Report is always looked through the prism by those who've put it together by what's the best for my party. When you have a discussion about whether we should have first past the pros or, or first or preferential voting, and you and I have had this discussion, it's about what's going to be best for my party, not what is best for democracy, what is best for decision making, what is the best for politics in the, in the country going forward. And somehow we need to raise the debate beyond what's good for me in this electoral cycle and my political persuasion and what's going to serve the country better. And if we have that debate, we'll start to get somewhere. Absolutely, and that's why looking at the Senate um, <laughs> committee recommendations, it looks, it looks to me like a stitch up by the three major parties. And I'm I think that's a bad you. way to organise a voting system. Under this proposed system. system, under this proposed system, Pauline Hanson would have got five senators in 1998. So it's not anti-minor party. Minor parties can get up if they get votes. And Palmer would have got, what, would you have thought in this last election it would have been changed to, uh, maybe three? Right. Or he would have got, his seat would have got up, um, Jackie Lammy wouldn't have got up. Lazarus would have been um, elected and that's all. Oh, Dio Wang in the second time around. Right. So, so Anthony, you, I think you were calling for a change to above the line voting and some sort of optional preferential below the line and also some way of regulating political parties so that they needed to have more than 500 members before they were registered as a party, is that right? The, the problem with party registration and nomination, which wasn't thought about in 84 but is now more evident, if you want to run a Senate ticket, if you're an independent and you want to run in Queensland, you need 200 nominators to get on the ballot paper. If you're a political party, if you're the three-day weekend party in Sydney and you get 500 people you know and you get registered, you immediately get the right to nominate candidates without nominators in every seat and in every upper house contest. That's why the ballot papers got so big, because all these micro parties suddenly could nominate in every state. They need to either make the, the registration tougher, as they are in every state. Every state is tougher than the Commonwealth law. Or you bring back nominators for the Senate. That will do something about the number of candidates on the ballot paper. As far as the above the line voting, the problem with the ticket voting is that if you vote one above the line, your preferences go all over the place by somebody else's ordering. The ideal to me was to be it's then under your choice, which is the system you've got in New South Wales. You vote one, and that's for that party. If you want to vote for anybody else, you go two, three, four above the line. Only about one in five people do that because it's not a well-known system. I think parties would be more interested in making people better known about it if it became the Senate, the Senate system. But that's putting the control of preferences. Um, Graham mentioned the, um, the, the, the Jim Killen case from 61. The point about that was the preferences did matter, but there were the preferences filled in by the voters themselves. Every preference that's counted in the lower house is filled in by a voter. It may be influenced by the heart of Ocard, but it's still filled in by the voter. 98% of the preferences in the upper house are a single one, and the preferences are determined by somebody else. And so you keep using the word make, make, that make it tougher. Make I don't it. understand why we want to make it tougher for people such as these in the audience to enter the political process. The, the, the problem with the political system is if it, there is nothing at the moment which will stop those giant ballot papers. The current system... And, is, unless, and, that's, and that's bad why? Yeah, yeah, because it's, people it's, can't it's, read the ballot paper. Well, let's look at the mechanism. Maybe we print a different type of ballot no, paper. No, Anthony, that's, yeah. that's missing the point. And you're miss, Glenn, that is just garbage, quite frankly, because... Well, it's garbage if you, if you want to run the country... Actually run. Uh, no, look... If you want to run the country, if you want to run a state, have some passion for it, have some commitment to it. Oh, I have passion. I no, have yeah, passion. you do. Okay, the you the process. Not just people. To that, what end, though? Not just people that either either no, are unionists in the Labor Party or lawyers in the Liberal National Party. Well, I'm not a lawyer, so thanks or for the farmers or whatever. I think actually what the issue here is, Glenn, is that not so much that people oppose the idea that independents or minor parties get elected to the Senate. That doesn't seem to be the big problem. The problem seems to be that the system is being gamed, that we are turning Senate elections into a lottery, where you simply... It's not a lottery, it's, uh, it's a fine art to get somebody elected. <laughs> but that's what, it's not a lottery, it's organised. The point, the point about passion, look, if you get passion and you can convince enough people to get exactly. 9, 10, 12 per cent, you'll get elected. If you've got passion and all you get is 0.2 per cent, but somebody's deals get you up, that's not how the system works. If you can't convince 
enough people how, how to small... actually make you a chance of getting elected. I know what people say to me, said, oh, the ticket voting system, but those people deliberately voted against the major parties, so that's how they should be represented. If you go to somewhere like Israel or, or the Netherlands, which have the most proportional system in the world, you need 0.6, 0.7% get elected. If you vote against the major parties for somebody, you vote for them. Under the Australian system like this, if you vote against the major parties for someone, you might elect somebody else you don't know because of the way this system is organised. It's fine having a protest vote. Like, I'm voting against the major parties. We'll vote positively for someone who's standing for it, not for somebody who, who's down the bottom of the ballot paper and then leapfrogs over everybody else to get elected. What about someone like David Lionhelm from the Liberal Democratic Party? He drew the first column on the New South Wales Senate paper. Uh, he got the donkey vote, as well as benefiting from people who are confused with his party being not the Liberal Democratic Party, but the Liberal Party. Is that the essential reason why he's in the Senate today? I mean, he did get 9% or so of the primary vote. It's confusion, very much confusion in the donkey vote on that giant ballot paper. But I'll say something else. People should read his evidence before the Joint Standing Committee on the Electoral Matters, where he talks about setting up other parties. His party, the Liberal Democrats, has two other parties very closely associated called the Outdoor Recreation Three. Party. And the, well, the other one, the bloke keeps accusing me of being wrong on that, but the other one's the Smoking Rights Association. Now, Clinton Mead, who's the Liberal Democrat candidate in Tasmania, has run many times for the Outdoor Recreation Party, and a month before the election was also the spokesman for the Smokers' Rights Association. Now, you speak to these people and they say, oh, well, people do that with the Liberals and Nationals all the time, but they usually have more than a month between their spokesmen. But he was, <laughs> he was elected mayor of Campbelltown at the same time as he was still in the running to be a senator from Tasmania. And yet, Lionel talks about attending um, car clubs and, and, and summer nats things and having difficulty explaining liberal democratic philosophy to these people who believe in revved cars but don't support gay marriage. And so he says, well, I will set up a party like the Outdoor Recreation Party, which appeals to people who can, are concerned about um, car issues and gun rights and stuff. And that's really liberal, liberal democratic philosophy. So if they vote for that party, which is called the Gun Party or the Shooters Party or the Car Party, and the preferences come to me, well, that's really their position anyway. So his view is you set up multiplicity of parties and don't tell the people really what they support. That they're front yeah, but, for yeah, other parties. Hang on, the major yeah, parties are. are doing that too. So all you're complaining about is that the minor parties have got professional. <laughs> well, I think that's probably good for, for politics. You're right, the major parties have been using front parties for years. But that's why you make the registration tougher. Yes, and I agree with you. I yeah, think but that's not some achieve of anything, Andrew. We're in the internet age. Some, you know, some, some, some of the reform million 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 email addresses would be pretty easy to do is, that. Is, Sorry. It's not email hundred. addresses. If you register a party in South Australia or New South Wales, you've got to walk in there with a document. Yes, sure, you, be able to, you can register them over the net. 1500 is not going to be No, hard. no, no. In New South Wales, you've got to walk in there with the form signed by the person. Now, now, Anthony's I'll raised a, a good point there. Yeah. Registration right now is far too easy. And one reason we do have a ballot paper that's a metre long, for you to set up a political party, start a Facebook page or something else on social media, put some emotive pictures up there and some emotive spiel, and Bob's your uncle, a week later you've got 500 people that have clicked, yes I want to join, you've got a political party. And we saw that with a party, uh, several of them actually, Coke and the Bubblers. When I ran for uh, school captain as, when I was 12 years old, my election speech was, if I'm elected I will put Coke in the Bubblers. Uh, You've been doing this for a very long time, haven't you? <laughs> and, and might I say, You're I was elected without any preferences. It was first past the post and... Uh, did you win? I did win. I did win. <laughs> but I did not fulfil my electoral uh, uh, okay. a, a pledge of putting uh, Coke Mel, in the I want, I want to come to you, Mel. Uh, so we've heard a range of the... <laughs> problems perhaps, although Glenn doesn't see them as a problem. We've heard some of the potential uh, solutions from Anthony, optional preferential voting and regulating parties. What is the government's position though on reforming the Senate voting system and abolishing these group voting tickets? Have you formulated a view on what you'll do in response to the joint committee? It hasn't been discussed in the party room, so you know the executive is the government, I'm a member that supports the government being a backbencher, so I'm not privy to what discussions have been had in cabinet at this point. The party would have had obviously uh, through the electoral matters committee uh, an input, so I think you've seen their views reflected in that. The Greens have come to you with a proposal like that? Well, they certainly haven't come to me, but they... The government. My understanding is that the three major parties, as Graham outlined, and I think Anthony agrees, have broadly agreed on a uh, what they think is reasonable 
electoral reform. The question is whether any reform will be put to the, uh, the Senate well, before the, the next election. With you. Well, they're, they're, you, you're right, they're sort of all over the shop. They, they, they actually, they, their members agreed in that report because that was they a... They did, and then they got the calculator out and put fresh batteries in it. Doesn't that come back to what I said earlier? They realise that well, if they back these reforms that, that they will be... <laughs> ah, so it's about personal interest again. I know we... Of course it, it is. Yeah, so of course it is, because the Conservatives in the long run will, will pick up more seats. Look, can I just digress yeah. a tiny bit? A tiny bit. We are, we are talking here about a voting system and what happened last time. But because of the changes in 1983, which means that it is virtually impossible, there's only been what, three times in history that there has been a majority of senators uh, or a majority in both houses to the governing party. When you have a widespread mood for change, you know, happened in 75, it happened in 1996, I mean, widespread change. The public have an expectation the country will change direction. We should have a system that allows on those occasions that the view of the public is reflective, and it's not. Yeah, well, it is, actually. Well, the last on. election was not an its time election. It was... No, no, I'm not referring to the last With election. Respect, I'm going... It was a Tweedledum and Tweedledumber election. Uh, and consequently, well, the vote for minor but, parties but, goes but, up. No, 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 you're missing the point. Forget last election. Take 1996. You won't argue with me since it was the biggest two-party preferred vote in Queensland since Correct. World War II, right? Okay, when that happens, let, 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 I think we should let So the talk. point being is this, very quick mathematics. When you go from having 10 senators to 12 in a state, half Senate election, half of 12 is six. To get more than a majority, to get a majority, four out of six, you need 66% of the vote in a state. When you have 10, half is five. 50% of it, more than 50% is 3 out of 2 is 60%. In other words, the mathematics says that when the public overwhelmingly want a change in direction, you can't get the change because a half Senate election with a perverted voting system, which means you need a massive majority, doesn't allow for the, the view of the public on those occasions. But there's a flip side to that, Mel, yep. and the flip side is that when the Howard government took a GST to the election, mm and they won the election just, yep. lost, the, lost the popular vote, won the election just, they were able to sit down with the senators, with the crossbench, and that's, which was, who was the Australian Democrats, and arguably the Democrats knocked some of the hard edges off uh, the IR legislation, knocked some of the hard edges off the GST, but both controversial pieces of legislation made it through the Senate. It suggests to me that government is better when negotiation and compromise occur. And what we saw in the final Howard term was a majority in the Senate, which you were advocating as a good thing for government because it allows their, you know, their electoral mandate to be implemented. But actually, they went too far. They had no one applying a handbrake. See, now that, that's where you, you are. I'm not arguing with what you've, just, uh, what you've said, but you've got the emphasis wrong. Governments are allowed to make mistakes and the public are allowed to get rid of them. Yep. Okay? So what you're arguing for is in 2004 when we got the majority, when Barnaby Joyce was the last elected, or sometimes we don't say it that way and someone else was, but anyway, <laughs> four in Queensland, that therefore that proves that it's not good for a government to have a majority. That's not right. It's the fact that people are fallible and make mistakes uh, and did go too far, and I was a casualty of that, doesn't mean that's a, de a, re a reason to disenfranchise the people sitting in front of us who have made a decision, because they can change the decision in a democracy in three years' time. But isn't the Senate the House of Review? Is, is, am yeah, I missing but, something? Well, it was a state's house. It's changed to a house of review because they didn't like the fact that it was a state's house. And, 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 well, it was never a state. I mean, it yeah. was designed as a state house and from yes. 1901 was always a party house. It was never a house of review till proportional representation was brought in in 49 because it was all, always either completely under the control of the government or completely under the control of the opposition. It has had a finer balance ever since. But the, the, the 1984 change in the size of the Senate was a critical change. They went from five per half Senate election to six. With five members elected, you could get a majority of the seats. Under six, it's almost impossible. Anthony Green, the ABC's election analyst, this is Big Ideas on RN and on your mobile via the ABC radio app. I'm Paul Barclay. Tonight, we're at the Noosa Long Weekend Festival discussing the Senate, which many an Australian government has had trouble dealing with. Mel Bruff, Graham Young and Glenn Drury are our other members of the panel. Let's return to the discussion. 
I think that probably politics is suffering a bit because of the loss of the Democrats, which was a middle party and could go either way. And there were more than one member there, so it was a bit more organised, the negotiation. But the fact that the Democrats aren't there, the Greens are there now, there are other micro parties. There's another point to make about electoral systems. Whatever you write now, the party structure may change. New parties may arise. The rise of one nation was quite sudden and it disappeared very quickly, but it emerged onto the scene and, and would have got more seats under the proposed system. Under the current system, it was locked out by the way ticket votes worked by the major parties. But what's happened, as I said since then, is the major parties knew how to do that and organised it that way. Since then, all the other micro parties have learned how to do this. And so they arrange their tickets. Parties and participants learn how to use the electoral system that exists. Sometimes you have to change the rules because it's no longer meeting an aim, aim of the electoral system as you think it should work. I think there is a place for small parties, but I think a party should get a significant vote. Get out there, campaign, get five, six, seven percent. Because, the Anthony, small parties are clearly disadvantaged, disadvantaged in the lower house, aren't they? I mean, a party like the Greens these days, you could, you could tell me the number, but they're polling around, uh, say, 10 percent of the, the vote at a House of Reps election, then they get what one lower house seat we, we, we have got a pr system which gives minor parties a chance in the upper house but the problem with the current system there is no urge to merge that exists in the current system because if you look at the different christian parties in this country or the different shooters and fishers party and the like you'll find each of them tends to be a little personal fiefdom and they don't get on with somebody else who's like them so they run separately and they just do their preference swaps to get elected so they can't resolve internal differences to grow they tend to operate on the system the system should reward parties that campaign for votes and get a significant vote in the case of one nation they weren't rewarded because the system prevented them from getting elected because the other parties behave in a particular way i think the system should be amended to give more power to the voters over their preferences one of the assumptions of this system and the whole ticket voting system is that people know their preferences all the way and at every point of the count the vote carries the same weight. If people only give preferences to the candidates they know, then the system will work to the benefit of the candidates and parties that do know, and I think a better, a more representative uh, parliament will be produced. Graham, if I can come to you and just looking at this current Senate around which there's been much discussion, is this a feral, obstructionist Senate, would you say, or, uh, or could the Prime Minister and Treasurer perhaps have dealt with the cross benches rather better than they have. Look, I think the Liberal Party could have dealt with the cross benches better than they have. Although I do think that there is a degree of ferality. Is that, <laughs> is that an adjective? Um, I'm not a big Jackie Lambie fan, in case you're wondering. So I think there's, there there are some illogicalities there that the government hasn't been dealing with well. But I think it's to the benefit of governments to actually have to deal with that. I take Mel's point that governments should be allowed to make mistakes and get voted out, but we shouldn't have to wait three years to rectify a mistake and, and we have this system of government which we basically took from the Americans with checks and balances and the Senate is part of the checks and balances and I think that it performs that role and unreasonable people are allowed to be unreasonable, political parties are allowed to be unreasonable but that, that unreasonability can be part of giving a democratic result that people are actually happy to accept because like, I, I run online qualitative polls and I ask people how they're going to vote and then I ask them why and just tell me in a sentence. I'm flabbergasted sometimes at the reasons that quite intelligent people give me for voting. There seems to be no connection between what they want to happen and why they want it to happen. So when you get this sort of irrationality being reflected in the Senate, I think it's actually to the benefit in terms of the public discourse. And I think one of the problems we've actually got why people turn off from politics is that a lot of the political discourse actually happens within the political parties and you don't actually see it. So we have this phrase, disunity is death, uh, which means that if Mel says something that disagrees with Tony Abbott, suddenly it's a big scandal that Liberal Party is divided. No, it's not. Mel's out on a frolic of his own. Uh, and people would be able to see that that's what's happening, but that's not the way we portray politics. But in the Senate, you do have these people who are independents, who might not always be reasonable, who might be feral sometimes, but they are actually giving voice to views and you can see that being argued out and I think at the end of the day it actually makes it easier for us to accept why we're doing this because we see the deal being beaten out in front of us. I do think one of the problems in the Senate, it, and both the major parties have tended to move towards this over the last three decades. Um, in the 80s, the Senate tended to work differently. And that is that um, having lost office parties or lost an election, parties increasingly look to the Senate 
to continue the election campaign to continue the politics against the government. And there's a, a general refusal to accept the mandate of a government. Yeah. And both sides of politics are very guilty of this. Um, and so neither of them can sort of say they're innocent on this. But that has become an increasing position over the last two decades, a refusal to accept a government's mandate. Occasionally you've got Keating in 1993 who said, we will accept the GST mm. if John Hewson wins the election. Now it was probably a masterstroke that helped him win that oh, election. Geez. Again, that was yeah. about politics, not policy, though. Yes. <laughs> it's just, but I mean, there is, there is that sense where at some point, that's where the Democrats did have a useful role in the Senate, is they tended to accept a government's mandate that knocked some edges off it. I think increasingly governments and the micro benches are getting used to this. I do think the Labor Party are better at negotiating with cross benches. Yeah, I, I suppose the central good. question really, what it comes down to, given that, as we've said, it's uh, very, very rare indeed for a government to have control of both houses, is is the Senate and the Senate cross bench leading Graham to better government or worse government? The range of, the raft of major challenges on the national agenda at the moment, many of which need really quite tough and complex policy solutions, uh, and I'm talking here uh, depending on both sides of the fence where you're sitting, is the Senate able to function in a way that allows for really tough, nuanced decision making to occur? Well, I think it is. I mean, my particular philosophical position is I'm a classical liberal, and you've got two senators there, Bob Day and David Lionhelm, who subscribe to that position. and. Um, I think are actually making that point of view more acceptable. I wouldn't call Bob Day a classical liberal. He's more a conservative liberal, if that makes sense. Oh, we won't quibble the, about the uh, deal. He's family, family, family first. first. Sorry, family yeah, look, he, he's, he he's, he's running for family <laughs> first, but he's not a typical family first type candidate. I'd say he's a classical liberal, but with um, uh, sort of strong family values, sort of socially conservative. Very socially but, conservative. But, but, so he, he's not a sort of dope smoking pro-gay marriage person like David Lionhelm is, but he still puts a very hard economic argument. Mm -hmm. uh, which are we pigeonholing people here today? I mean, <laughs> we pigeonholing people here today. <laughs> well, dope smoking got... gays and <laughs> we've, well, we've got uh, we've got obviously Graham, 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 Graham and Mel. No, so. I just hadn't picked it up around the halls of Parliament. That's all. So. I, was just, I was just saying Graham and uh, Mel and Graham's politics is open and transparent and clear. And of course, Anthony and I work for the ABC, so we have no politics at all. <laughs> Uh, we're, not, we're not allowed to have any politics. Um, but Glenn, what, what is your politics? Uh, David, David Lanholm, who worked with you for some time, seems rather confused as to what it is. How would you describe your own political leanings and inclinations? Well, I, I, I like a diversity of views in the parliament. I'm not sure that I want to be pigeonholed as being left nor right. Do you have a philosophy? You must have a, ph a philosophy, an overarching view? Of I do, but, uh, you know, I think the way I vote is the way, is, is very private to me. In fact, it's always below the line, mind you. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I would be very much in the centre. Very much. A little right on some issues, a little left on other issues, but we could go into specifics if you want to. But uh, uh, first and foremost, I believe in diversity in the parliament and real democracy. And so that would mean that you would work with parties, work with micro parties who, may, who you may well assist in getting elected, whose politics is rather different to your own. I have done. When I operate the Minor Party Alliance, and that is simply bringing all the minor parties together in a room not unlike this, with numbers, numbers not too dissimilar to this, I've made the, the decision many years ago, in fact in 1999, that I would not discriminate on the basis of philosophy. It's not for me to say you're right and you're wrong. It's for the voters to do that. And in fact, I made a point of sitting the communists next to one nation. They didn't know who they were, and I, I used the argument that everybody in this room has something in common. Even the communists in one nation, well, you should have seen the body language. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mel, how do you view, I mean, obviously you're in the situation where you're part of the government, and your government is frustrated by the fact that a, a number of its uh, key pieces of legislation have been unable to get through the Senate. H how do you feel the Senate has been performing this, this time around? Do you think it's overreached? Look, I think what, Anthony what your assessment I think Anthony um, was sort of going down a line which I'm glad to be able to follow, and that is that if you can pigeonhole your opposition, so forget Liberal and Labor for a moment, forget who's in government, just take the, the principle. 
go down to your local church group, go to your Rotary Club, well, not so much Rotary, but just about any community association and overlay the same principles. People vote against rather than for someone. I'm getting rid of that individual. So if you can make that individual or that party look unpalatable, or in this case, make the government look like it can't govern, and that's what you were saying earlier about obstructing, remaining as though you're still in power, it's not because you're trying to hang on to the vestiges of power, it's because by doing so, you're sending a message, this mob aren't in control, and that sends the message to the, the greater mob, the public. So uh, that is the dynamic that we need to try and change in the nation that we look at what we can achieve, not what we can uh, stymie. We look for compromises on both sides. If the coalition hadn't learnt from the first 12 months in government, then the country would be ungovernable today. So people like Scott Morrison and Greg Hunt, etc., have found a way through a challenging uh, environment and people are learning on that process. But the fundamental approach is so much from all sides when in opposition see how much we can make the other side look ungovernable because that's what the public sentiment will work towards in other words I can vote against someone rather than for. And if we can start to change that dynamic so someone actually knows who the, the candidate is on point zero two and says, I want to vote for them rather than voting against a major party or some other secular party, then we give ourselves a chance. Well, that's true. And before the last election, the government made it clear, when they were then opposition, they made it clear that they thought the budget deficit was a major priority. And then Tony Abbott, as opposition leader, went out of his way to rule out before the election, all of these measures that he would take that could potentially deal with the budget deficit, there'll be no cuts to hospitals, there'll be no cuts to the ABC, to SBS, there'll be no cuts to education and so forth, and got in and said, oh, you know, things are a lot worse than what we thought, and um, we now need to cut you all of those before, things. have you? Yeah, and of course, all government, oh, I, I, you know, I could have picked, I could have picked, I could have picked any, I could have picked any government, actually, in the last 20 years, actually. But so for me, is, it might be easier to pick a different This one. is the most, <laughs> <laughs> this is the most recent example of something that's been going on for years. And, and, and if what we're saying is we want more transparent government, wouldn't a good start be telling the voters before the election what you intend to do? So so it's a really, seriously a good point because one of the problems you have, and I think it was alluded to earlier on the panel, and whilst we're sitting here in a town hall meeting, you all go away with a, a view which has been formed by hearing four, five voices, your own thoughts and your own input, input shortly. And yes, uh, Radio National listeners that listen to all of it, they will. But the reality is it's something that particularly I say as a person who's part of the government says today gets chopped into 10 seconds, whack out there without any context of where this is, and then you are on the defensive. And that's where the media and the media cycle and the way we absorb the media today, in fact, it won't even be my words, it will be a 120 character tweet. Mm. And from there it goes like uh, fire. That's why I think you have seen even the way in which people speak, the fluency has gone because you're worried about the next word that's going to come out of their mouth because that one word can be enough to change the debate for the next 24 hours in the, in the media cycle. You mean like helicopter? <laughs> no idea what you mean. <laughs> I think he means more like Canada. <laughs> well, no, exactly. Oh, that's you know, a really good example. It's a really good about. example. And look, I lament that, but we need to fight against it because it's here. The media has changed. But, you know, Paul, we can't then just say, oh, yeah, OK, but that's part of it. It's such a fundamental part of it. So politicians yes. are absolutely petrified of saying something that can be taken out of context. And what does the, the media do? Not the ABC on its own. Everyone is. Mm. Will you rule out? And then the next, the next part of the, the equation is Mel Brough today refused to rule out on six yes. separate occasions. Yeah. Reid, he is actually going to do this to you. I don't think Jackie Lambie subscribes to that philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Drury, the preference whisperer, an independent and minor party strategist and electoral campaigner. You also heard from Mel Brough, the federal Liberal member for Fisher, Anthony Green, the ABC's election analyst, and Graham Young, publisher of Online Opinion and Executive Director of the Australian Institute for Progress and a former state campaign chairman and vice president of the Queensland Liberal Party. That was an edited version of a forum recorded at last month's Noosa Long Weekend Festival. You can post your thoughts on this and other Big Ideas discussions by visiting our website abc.net.au slash rn. 
follow the prompts to Big Ideas. While you're there, you can subscribe to our podcasts. That's it for Big Ideas for today. Thanks for listening. Until tomorrow, I'm Paul Barclay. Bye for now. to progress, we sometimes need to shake things up a bit. So on future tense, we meet several people who question some